Good to see everyone here. We're very excited to have Warren Aiken here to uh, talk about artificial intelligence and the things that he is he's prepared for us. Uh, we appreciate our sponsors, especially that we'll hear from in a minute, that's able us to provide lunch and uh, and to provide this uh, terrific opportunity. Um, and and a big reason why we're having this particular event is the energy that Professor Juliet Marangello and also. Uh, Dean Hussey has put into our uh, business advising program. And it's exciting to see the different programming and other kinds of events and courses and uh, activities that uh, Professor Morangello and Professor Hussey have developed for us. So um, I'm going to turn the time over now to, to Professor Morangello. Um, thank you, Dean Johnson. I'm delighted to welcome everybody to the Business Advising Program's Fall CLE Program on Artificial Intelligence and Modern Legal Practice, a Vision of Law for the 21st Century. Um, Widener Commonwealth's Business Advising Program will graduate its sixth class of students this year, and we are really fortunate to have great advice from members of our alumni advisory board, several of whom are in the audience, and we thank you very much for your support and advice. Um, the program equips students with the doctrinal foundation and lawyering skills to advise businesses small and large. We also bring innovative CLE programming like today's event to our community. Um, before I introduce our speaker, several thank yous are in order. Um, first, of course, to Deans Johnson and Hussey for their support of the business advising program. Um, our CLE programs could never run without the hard work of Sandy Grafe, our special programs coordinator. I'd also like to thank Angela Cepela, our director of annual, and give, uh, annual giving and alumni engagement for her help with this event. We are especially grateful for the financial support of Members First Federal Credit Union and Eckert Siemens. Um, and before we get started and before I introduce our speaker, Billy Morrison of Members First would like to say a few words. Thank you, and now for the main event. We are so fortunate to welcome to Harrisburg Warren Agan, who is a national leader in the field of legal analytics. Warren comes to us from Boston, where he is a senior consultant and director of professional development from Lex, with Lex Predict LLC, which provides services in legal analytics, legal data science, and training, risk management, and legal data strategy consulting. Warren founded and currently chairs the American Bar Association Business Law Section's Legal Analytics Committee, which helps business lawyers understand how to use artificial intelligence and other analytic techniques. A practicing lawyer for almost 30 years, Warren teaches legal analytics as an adjunct professor at Boston College Law School and is of counsel to Swigert and Agan LLC. Welcome, Warren. We all look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Juliet. I really appreciate the opportunity to come down and talk to everybody here about this interesting topic. It, it's really, I think, the sort of the next thing in the legal field that's going to impact pretty much everything that you're doing. And for those of you especially who are students and just getting started in your careers, you know, I, the way I look at it is, you know, I've been practicing for almost 30 years. Um, <clears throat> you know, you're going to be here thinking about what you're doing for the next 30 or 40 years and this stuff that we're going to talk about today is going to really have a really big impact on what you do as lawyers uh, through that career. It, more so, I think, than the people that you're dealing with now who are already partners in the, in the legal field. So as Juliet said, um, I'm, I've been a practicing lawyer for about 30 years doing primarily uh, corporate and bankruptcy work. And um, I developed a, 
a skill set in doing data analytics and dealing with artific artificial intelligence systems. And uh, I'm currently working for LexPredict as a, as a senior consultant. So, and they do law plus data plus strategy. That's my, my one LexPredict slide. So what we're going to talk about today, and I'm going to try to finish it up by one um, and try to leave some room for questions. But I'm going to break this talk into a couple of segments. I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of what's going on. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of artificial intelligence, where these technologies came from. Uh, we'll talk about where they are now. We'll talk a little bit about where they're going to go. And I'm going to wrap up with five slides of sort of predictions about how artificial intelligence systems are going to affect the legal profession going forward. So <coughs> the thing we have to focus on right now in the legal profession is that we are in, a, in an area of change. Uh, has anybody here read, uh, written some, I'm sorry, not written, read any of the books by Richard Susskind? We have any? Okay. So I, I would really suggest when you get a chance to pick up one of these books and read them. Uh, Future of the Professions is the most recent one. Future Law is another. I think he's one of the, the sort of the, the, the real thought leaders. I hate that term, but the real, one of the people who's doing the best job in sort of thinking out what's going on and, and how things will change. So this is worth picking up and reading. Uh, but what he really points out is that technology is going to change, it has been changing, how the legal profession operates. And we're at the point now where this change is becoming very real. So let's talk about AI. How many people in the room feel that they know what artificial intelligence is? Okay, we got one. But what's your background? Uh, what, what, do you have a definition for it? No, you had a mouthful of food. All right. What you're seeing on the screen is not artificial intelligence. Now, we are all exposed by movies, books, to this idea that there's these mechanical intelligences, and they're usually female, they're usually locked in a room somewhere, and then they bust out and they kill people. Or uh, <coughs> they're like a computer on a spaceship, which goes wild and kills people, um, that there's, there's these thinking machines that are sort of like people and maybe they're not people or maybe they are human. We, we treat them as sort of characters, but artificial intelligence is not that. And I will say we see this tendency within the people writing about artificial intelligence as law. They have the same tendency. They talk about the rights of the computers down the line. They talk about artificial intelligence and ethics and choices and things like that. And they create this impression that artificial intelligence systems are something more than what they are. Uh, in fact, artificial intelligence is by and large just simply machine learning. They're math, it's math, okay? It's math techniques and algorithms that are run on computers and they do very useful things. This slide has a list of some of the most common of these machine learning systems. Regression, so if anybody's done any sort of medium to advanced mathematics courses or statistics courses, you have been introduced uh, to regression systems. Uh, certainly if you've done engineering, you've been introduced to regression, linear regression for example. Uh, this is a machine learning tool. Uh, expert systems, which are simply ways of structuring information flowing through a computer system to make choices, decision trees. Uh, random forest decision trees, which is an automated way of building sort of a decision tree. Uh, something called support vector machines, a little bit technical, but it's really just a way of mathematically dividing things into categories. K nearest neighbors, and of course the famous neural networks, the deep learning, which when you learn about neural networks, you realize it's something more than layers of regression systems. So it's actually conceptually very simple in its little building blocks. Uh, when you expand on the idea and you you get into uh, you build on these mathematical algorithms and you layer them together neural networks do uh, very complex computational uh, techniques uh, it's a very complex computational tool but at the end of the day at the end of the day these are simple uh, it's simple mathematical uh, mathematically based algorithms okay and that's all artificial intelligence systems are now, <coughs> machine learning tools can do very useful things. They can group objects into categories. 
So for example, you can take a lot of pictures and a machine learning algorithm can be taught to separate the pictures of cats from the pictures of dogs. Okay, grouping things into categories. It can discover categories of objects. Okay, so you can put in a bunch of random pictures and a machine learning algorithm can sort of group them and lo and behold you look at the groups and cats are over here and dogs are over here and elephants are over here and it's sort of figured out on its own that these things are different. Again, it's not thinking, it's just a mathematical technique for looking at the information about those objects and using that information to find differentiation uh, characteristics. Uh, it can discover and remember the relationships between objects. Okay, which objects relate to other objects. And it can find the best path through layers of decisions, usually using statistics and often a lot of tools use what are called Bayesian statistical methods, which are a little bit more complex statistics, but it's still just statistical methods for figuring out what the best series of choices will be in a particular situation. So these are useful. Uh, the thing about machine learning today is it can do these things at scale. It can do them very quickly and very consistently and it can do it without getting tired. So, I'll give you an example. If I gave you a contract and I asked you to tell me whether it was a lease or a financing agreement, you could do that, right? Anybody here could do that. So we can teach a machine to do that. Now, the difference is if I gave you a million of these contracts and asked you to come back to me in an hour and have them in two piles, okay, you could not do that. You can't do a million of them. But if you teach a machine to differentiate between those two types of contracts, the machine can do that. It can do it very quickly. It can come, you come back in an hour and that will be sorted. Come back in a minute if you have the right computer and it will be sorted. It will always do it the same way every time. It will do it consistently. And it won't get tired about 300,000 contracts in and have its mind start to wander or things float before its eyes, right? So it will do it at scale very quickly, very consistently without getting tired. And because it can do these things, uh, machine learning systems can do stuff that frankly seems a little bit amazing. And it's not that what it's doing is so amazing, it's just it's doing a lot of work to get to a really interesting point. All right. The other thing machine learning can do is it can take advantage of computers' ability to hold and manipulate large sets of data and information. A way of thinking about this, you're here in school, right? They're going to have you read cases, and you're going to learn some of those cases. Okay? You're going to learn a subset of cases that exist. There's obviously lots and lots of case law out there. You're going to learn a subset of it. And some of those cases you're actually going to remember. If somebody asks you a question about a particular legal issue, you might remember which case applies to it, or you might not, even though you read that case. Computers do not work like that. If we feed the text of a, all the cases into a computer, that computer will remember all the text of all those cases. And it will not forget that text. And it can use all of that text. The hard part is getting it to make the association between the question and the text it has finding a way for it, let it to find a way for it to do something useful with that text. Machine learning systems can create that connection and take advantage of the fact that the computers have the ability to hold and remember and manipulate these very large data sources. <laughs> and as a result, we're at this turning point right now where uh, machine learning systems are starting to make a real impact, not just on the legal profession, but of course on a lot of the world around us. So. From this point, I want to talk about the past a little bit to create some baseline, give you a little bit more idea about sort of where all this comes from. We'll see where we are in the present, both generally and within the legal uh, community. And we'll talk a little bit about how machine learning uh, may be transforming legal services. Okay, so first, the past, right? We'll talk a little bit about the past so we can understand the future. So the foundation for machine learning really goes back into the 1940s. I, everybody know who Alan Turing is? You see that movie uh, about the differential machine? I forget what it was called. Who remembers the name of that movie? 
Alan Turing and making the computer that uh, solved the uh, German uh, codes? Nobody remembers. I, I, I forget the name of it, too. But basically, he created a device called the Bomba, with a B-O-M-B-E. And this was the first universal computing device, first machine designed that could theoretically do anything, as opposed to doing a single thing. Okay. Uh, and so you have this framework on which you can do any sort of computation. Soon after, we had a paper by McCulloch and Fitz called A Logical Calculus of Ideas, Imminent and Nervous Activity. In other words, what they did is they thought about how the human brain works, perhaps, but they developed sort of a, a mathematical way of describing that. This math, coupled with a slightly later article by John von Neumann, who was the father of modern computing, and Oscar Morgenstern, who's a very famous game theorist, uh, that was basically the structural basis for game theory, started mathematicians mostly thinking about how you could design computer systems that could do some very interesting things. And that those computer systems became the basis for machine learning. Uh, again, 1950s and 1960s, we see the foundations of these systems being designed mostly by mathematicians and by computer scientists. Now, it's important to keep in mind that although systems were being designed, and again, it's mostly math, so when I talk about systems, I'm not talking about actually building a computer or even designing the software. I'm talking about designing the math to do uh, these kinds of functions. In fact, the computers didn't really exist to run these systems. Uh, and some of the earlier ones, the real problem wasn't coming up with the idea or even designing the mathematics or structures. The real problem was getting a computer that was fast enough and powerful enough and held enough data to actually do anything useful. First program was checkers. And we see in as far back as 1958, the invention of something called the perceptron, which is essentially a way of thinking about a regression system. Um, mathematically, it's a fairly simple equation. And it's a way of modeling it. And it was designed to sort of model what they thought neurons did. And they may have been right about what neurons do in the brain. But it's this idea of a perceptron. The idea was that you would take a number of pieces of information, like five or six pieces of information, or eight or whatever. It could be hundreds of pieces of information. You would find a weight or a number that you multiplied that piece of information by. You add up all those multiplied numbers, and you come out with an output. Essentially, it's a regression formula. That's what regression is um, when you're using multiple variables. This was called a perceptron all the way back to 1958. When you hear about deep learning, neural networks, and all that kind of fancy stuff, it's all, it's all, it's all built using perceptrons. So those systems have their grounding all the way back to 58. Bayesian methods designed during this period of time. First natural language processing system called ELISA was invented during this prime. It was a, uh, it was a system that mimicked uh, psychoanalysis and it was so good it was so good that people would actually try to sign up for sessions for it so they could be psychoanalyzed uh, but uh, it was really just sort of a little bit of a gameplay and the first expert based system was invented during this period of time moving to the 80s and the 90s and we really see during this period of time again we're still more than 20 years ago the invention of pretty much every other system that's in use today. Uh, invention of backwards propagation in 1982 allowed them to link together large numbers of perceptrons and make them do something useful. That's basically 1982, we saw the first real neural networks. Uh, expert systems became heavily commercialized during this period of time. Uh, random forest decision trees are invented. Support vector machines were invented. So by the time we get to the turn of the century, we have the math and algorithms for pretty much all of the machine learning systems that underlie modern day um, artificial intelligence. <coughs> but it wasn't until today, or really the last 10 years or so, that we have seen really useful things being done with these systems. Right? Everybody knows about IBM Watson 
and it's beating the world champions at Jeopardy. AlphaGo a couple of years ago beat the world champion at Go. Uh, and I'll talk about some of these other things. One is, is listed on this slide. Facebook a couple of years ago, they do facial recognition systems. They've achieved human level performance. In other words, uh, Facebook is better at identifying a picture of you uh, than uh, than a friend or another human being would be. Okay. And we also see machine learning as a service from IBM Watson, Amazon and the AWS series, also Microsoft through its Azure product. In other words, the ability for anybody, anybody who's building computer systems to tap into machine learning products and integrate them into whatever they're doing. So to recap this part of the talk, uh, machine learning is not new. The technology, the ideas, the algorithms, they date back really before the turn of the century. Um, but the impact on our professional life was very small. So, right? I mean, we did not see lawyers using machine, level, machine learning systems in 2000. We didn't even see it through most of society. So. The, the ideas were there, the technology that was there, the techniques were there. What changed? All right. Let's talk about the present. What's different today is the technology, right? Now, uh, we got a young crowd here, right? So what I'm going to show you is going to be a little bit funny. And it's uh, for the older folks, you may have a tendency to sort of think, as I often do, in technology in terms of what was around at the turn of the century. For the younger people, you may not realize how backwards we were only 20 years ago. So the main difference is the hardware. The techniques were there. The problem is you did not have computers that could run them. Machine learning techniques are what are called computationally expensive. And what that really means is just there's a lot of math. And when I say a lot of math, I mean a lot of mathematical computation that goes on. Okay? So you need to have computers that are fast enough and powerful enough to run all that math within reasonable periods of time. Now, this is a Paragon XPS 140. In 1994, this was the hottest computer in the world. So 1994, I'm already out of law school, right? A bunch of people in this room are already out of law school. This is the fastest computer in the world in 1994. Uh, how many people would have had ex uh, access to this computer? Well, if you were the U.S. government, you could have bought one. IBM obviously had one because they made them. Uh, you know, the CIA would have one. Uh, you know, Caltech or MIT might have one, but smaller universities would never have had access to a machine like this. Okay. So how powerful was this computer? So in other words, it would not have been available. If you were in a law firm, you did not have access to this kind of technology, this kind of speed and power, okay? All right. This is my phone. My, te my telephone is more powerful than that IBM, okay? So think about that for a second. Just go back. And you're talking about, like, turn-of-the-century technology and what it was. And what I'm telling you is you're, everybody in this room is walking around with more computing power in their pocket than a major corporation would have had at the turn of the century. Okay? And so what that means is that the tools that were not available to them back then are available to you now. This is a nice little graph that shows you the increase in computer power over the last 10 years. It's been exponential. It's, it has been branching off and leveling off for the last three or four, uh, last seven or so years. But before that, it's been exponential in growth. And this has made a real difference. So I'm going to give you an example of how this applies in the artificial intelligence world. Okay. Th this company, this car is called Talos. It's from MIT. It was uh, built for the Urban Challenge in 2007. That was a, a DARPA project where they would take uh, autonomous vehicles and they would run them around and see how they worked. Uh, this was the fourth place winner. It barely finished. It almost gone to a crash. It would stop, start, stall. It wasn't very good. Now, it's very hard to tell from the picture, but I had an opportunity to see this car at MIT a few years back. I will tell you that it's a good-sized SUV, and it is packed 
front to back, top to bottom, side to side with computing equipment. That is one giant mobile computer. And if you notice the picture, there's a large air conditioning unit on top of it. That's needed to keep the equipment cool enough so the car can continue to run. So that's where we were 10 years ago, okay? If you wanted to have an autonomous vehicle running on the road poorly, not even doing a good job, you had a packet full of computing equipment. This is what we have in 2017, okay? The Google Waymo self-driving car, completely autonomous, in, in operation in Arizona, running around the streets of Arizona on its own in the wild. How big is its computer? It's about the size of a desktop sits in the trunk. Waymo builds its own, so it's a custom-built machine. The, uh, but it, it's, it's the size of a small desktop. So that's the difference in computing power over a 10-year period. And that's what enables us to have a self-driving car. 10 years ago, 10 years ago, you could not have the cars out on the road that we have because you would have had to pack the entire car full of computer equipment, and that computer equipment probably would have cost you a few million dollars. Okay. So again, it's about the computing power and the data. That's what's changing. It's not the techniques. If you have enough power, okay, you can use these computer to algorithm techniques to use math to discover relationships and data. And that's really what these artificial intelligence systems are doing. Okay, so uh, here's the result. I'm going to go through a few slides and tell you where these systems are today. I, I run into a lot of lawyers who think that this stuff really isn't going to affect law. I think we still run into a lot of people like that. Uh, a lot of them think that these computers can't do what they can do. So I'm going to show you a few examples of what these computers are capable of now. Well, of course, IBM Watson beating Jeopardy. So again, this is actually an old one from 2011. But this is really about being able to take a simple question in plain language and link it up with data to pull an answer out. Large, large data pools worked in real time, able to beat the world champions. So. That's, again, that's seven-year-old technology. 2016, this is a fascinating example. Young, young girl, rare cancer, all over the world, best doctors. None of them could figure out what kind of cancer she had. Nobody could make a diagnosis. They took her genetic uh, blueprint, genetic information, some other test information, fed it into Watson, and Watson was able to do the diagnosis. Again, not because Watson's smarter than these lawyers, it's just because it has all the information and the ability to make the connections between the information fed into it and the information it's holding. The reality is the human doctors simply don't have the capability to remember every cancer study ever done and all the information in those studies. And because they can't acquire all that information and remember all that information and uh, bring it out on demand, they are unable to make the connection that was made in this case but the computer system can do it. Uh, the most complicated, sophisticated game in the world is supposed to be Go. And uh, last year, uh, Google's AlphaGo program was able to defeat the world champion KG Go uh, in this game. So horribly complex game. And again, this is not, you can't, you can't. Go is even, even Go. There's too many options with all the pieces on the board. So you can't, like, break it down manually, you have to come up with strategies where the computer literally is doing something similar to what a human is, which is I'm not thinking out the game to the end. I'm making a decision now about which choice on the board is likely to get me to the best result. The computer is doing that statistically without looking to the end results. The human does it a little bit more heuristically, and the computer does it better. And what's really interesting is after building AlphaGo, Google then built another system which it trained by playing against AlphaGo. And within a week of playing head-to-head -head games with itself, or its old version, the new version of AlphaGo was able to beat the uh, older version consistently. So you might say, as a lawyer, I know I would think this. I'd say, well, that's fine. Go is, but it's very defined. You can understand it. 
there's a structure to it. Same with chess, same with checkers, right? But what I do as a lawyer isn't like that. I deal with uncertainty. I deal with unknowns. I play, I have to understand my, the, the, the lawyer on the other side and the client and the other person's client and how they're thinking. And I can do that, but a computer couldn't possibly do that. Well, poker is like that too. It has defined rules, but it also has elements of chance. And when you're playing against human opponents, the real question isn't about what cards they have versus what cards you have. It's really about how they think. And are they betting when they have good cards? Are they betting when they have bad cards? There's a lot of game theory in it, but there's a lot of this human element. So you would think a computer can't do that. Well, a computer can. We had two projects that came out literally in 2017. One of them was uh, designed by Carnegie Mellon called Liberatus. was able to beat top-ranked professional players. And another one from uh, University of Alberta called DeepStack was also able to be professional players in a heads up, no limit Texas Hold'em, okay? And not just, you know, win. I mean, it was able to basically destroy them in gameplay. Uh, Deep Stack, by the way, is capable of being played on a laptop at regular speeds. So it's not like one of these situations where it has to go and sit around and churn through data for an hour. It can play in real time. So let's talk about where we are today with lawyers. Where are we in using machine learning in the legal field? Hi. So there's a lot of simple applications available to us that are machine learning based. Voice recognition is one. We have systems that can sort documents into categories. So wherever you're thinking about pleadings or contracts and so forth, we have systems that can do a very nice job when trained to do so of dividing those documents into stacks of different categories. We can find clauses in documents. So if you're looking for the default clause, computer systems are designed that can find the default clauses in your contracts. Uh, we can predict linear relationships, which is just a way of saying that if there's two relationships with two, two things and they're sort of more or less, one, when one increases, the other increases, or when one decreases, the other one increases, um, you have that sort of back and forth relationship. For example, if in fact the uh, severity of somebody's injury has a direct correlation with the amount of money they'll get in a judgment. Computer uh, systems can find those relationships and predict them. Uh, and they can identify common behaviors. So if you have a large set of information about what's going on in a case through negotiations or litigation, and uh, there are patterns in there that are relatively common, computers can identify those patterns and tell you what they are. They're not as good about finding the outliers, Okay, but they also can tell you when something that's going on is in fact an outlier. It's called anomaly detection. So these are very sort of simple applications and there's a lot of them. Uh, there's a lot of them already out there being with products being developed or built. Uh, but uh, when you think about what you might be doing in a particular area of the law, uh, you would find that there's a lot of other applications out there that have not yet been built or not being built by somebody. So it's, it's, it's helpful to go back and sort of look at the building blocks of these sort of types of things that the computers can do. And then when you look at an application or a task that you might be doing as a lawyer, you might be able to say, well, look, this part, I, I think a computer could do this. Um, we have machine learning as a service available to lawyers. And this is really uh, one of the most uh, interesting parts because anybody who's building a computer system or a computer product can in fact uh, port information off to uh, some of these cloud-based vendors and get back results using their machine learning uh, uh, applications. So for example, Watson can give you natural language interfaces, uh, natural language classifiers, tone analyzers, really interesting. Tone analyzers is, is somebody angry? Are they unhappy? So, you know, using that, that kind of thing that some people are really good at, right, listening to the other side and getting a sense as to how they feel. Computers can actually do that. A uh, really interesting application of this is being done by LegalZoom. They do divorce work. So if they have somebody who calls them about doing divorce work, uh, they run that conversation through a tone analyzer, and they can identify people who might be stressed enough to hurt themselves or others. 
and then what they do is they find ways of getting them some additional assistance or non-legal, I mean non-legal assistance. What they're trying to do is identify people who might be planning to commit suicide uh, because they are in a stressful life situation, and they've built computer systems to help them do that. Uh, Amazon has chatbots, image recognition, regression models, other machine learning tools. Uh, there's a lot of other things available now from these cloud vendors. And again, lots of companies, lots and lots of companies. This slide's about two years old. Uh, it is uh, a far more crowded field now of all the companies that are coming out there. Some of them are direct artificial intelligence plays. So they actually go out there and build systems. I mean, that's what my company does. Uh, others uh, do things that are perhaps more mundane, but they are able to do it better uh, than it has been done before because they're using machine learning systems to accomplish the work. And some of them just uh, tie into uh, machine learning in the background. But these are all companies that are doing really new and innovative things in the legal industry because they're using machine learning systems and artificial intelligence systems. So as an example, is contract analytics from Contract Suite, which uh, you know basically can, has tools in it to pull contracts apart, sort them, sort the clauses apart, find things within those contracts, identify which things are case citations, identify which are names of people, uh, identify you know default clauses, identify which things are numbers, and then you can take those information pieces and either use them in your your contract review or you can take them and build them, feed them into another system and does something with them. So uh, that's where we are now. Let's talk a little bit about where we might end up being in the future. Here's the biggest question that I think a lot of people sort of think about. Uh, I, and it's, it's worth thinking about, right? Are we going to be replaced by machines? Now, I don't think there's anybody out there who says the answer is yes, but we'll talk a little bit about why it may be no. Um, so to recap a little bit, right, there are things computers can already do better than you. They can drive a car better than you. They really can. Uh, they can play poker better than you, recognize somebody you meet on the street better than you. They can certainly read a book and remember the content better than you. Uh, they can review documents for specific things if they're trained to do that, and they can do that in bulk uh, better than a human can. Uh, they can remember things, right? Which is important to think about, right? I mean, people don't remember everything properly, and even worse, sometimes we think we know something, and it turns out we have remembered it wrong. We have false memories. Computers do not do this. Uh, and computers can do math much, much better than humans can. Humans are actually pretty, pretty bad at math, okay? If we can do it at all, with lots of training, we do it very slowly. When computers do it well, and they do it fast, um, and that can make a big difference in how you approach problems. So, these computers, they can do simple things, we talked about that. They can do uh, really complicated things, but they can't do everything. This is why they're not going to replace lawyers. You can't, there's no, there's no machine out there right now, and not for decades that can take any sort of task and just do it. People can do that. Okay? And some tasks are more complex. You need a lot of training, like going to four years of law school, and some some tasks are very simple and you just need to see it once and you can do it. But people can do that. Computers can't. These systems need to be designed and trained specifically for each task. So if you have something you want a computer to try to do, you have to define that task very clearly, very precisely and you need to build the system to do precisely that. Okay? So, humans, one is we're already designed. We don't need to be built to do a task. We're already sort of, the thinking machines come from root. Now, it does take years to train very complex skills and build knowledge, but we're very flexible. I mean, you take somebody in this room and we train them to do all sorts of different things. Right? Uh, of course, we work slowly, and you build a like you bought a, a, a lawyer, right? Four years of law school, you, three years of law school, you built a lawyer, but you only get one lawyer, right? Every, you have to build one lawyer after another lawyer after another lawyer. So machines, now, it can take years to design some of these systems. And I don't kid you, right? We talk about Facebook achieving human recognition, uh, human levels of facial recognition 
It's not an easy thing to do. That takes large teams of very well-trained people, very large periods of time, to build those systems and design them to get them to work. Multiple, multiple years of work, millions and millions of dollars of investment, okay? Uh, so years to design a system. Now, once you have a system, you can train the skills into it very quickly. You can build knowledge very quickly, pumping into a system. Those systems can work very quickly. And once they're trained, they're there, and they're easy to duplicate. So Facebook comes up with a way of doing facial recognition, and now it has it. It doesn't have to rebuild that. If it wants to double the number of faces it wants to recognize, it can very easily replicate its computing systems, its software, and have that capability. Okay? It doesn't have to spend another three years and another, you know, tens of millions of dollars to, uh, to come, you know, to build another recognition system. Uh, and the machines can work very quickly. So in some kinds of tasks, especially for large volumes, the machine just does it faster. And sometimes that's the advantage. All right. This is sort of the same slide. So, again, machine learning systems, once built, they can outperform humans consistently uh, once you get to that point. And they can process the documents and data in electronic speeds. And this is sort of the same slide. And I know this is not talking about why we don't need lawyers. It's a little bit about, again, it's more scary stuff. Uh, this slide is about a study that was done in 2017 based on uh, surveys that were given to data scientists in 2016, okay? And what these people did is they went out to data scientists over all over the world and they said, look, give us an estimation of how long you think it's going to take machines to be able to do certain tasks. How long do you think it's going to take? And the main question they wanted to ask was, how long do you think it's going to be until we have a computer system that can do any human intelligence task? In other words, you give it something that requires intelligence to solve uh, on the part of a human, and the machine will be able to do it. And the results were pretty interesting. I just have to get to some of the answers. So here's some of the prediction answers. So one was poker by 2019. As I pointed out, that was actually achieved in 2017. Uh, they'd be able to write a high school essay by 2026, okay? Uh, the prediction for when the computer systems would be able to play Go at human levels was 2028. And as I said, that was achieved earlier this year. 2051 was the prediction for when machines would be able to write a New York Times bestseller. Literally the point at which computer systems would be able to write a book, and it would be a great book, okay? 2051. And the prediction for any human intelligence task was 2060. So that's a mean. Now, some people thought it would be earlier, some people thought it would be later, but the mean answer from the data scientists was 2060. So that's 42 years out. That's the prediction from the people who build the systems on how long it will take to get there. So that's a little scary. Now, let's get to the non-scary part. As it turns out, the prevailing thinking is that uh, although computers will be able to do certain things very, very well, the best results are obtained and have been obtained when the computers work with human experts. So there's a 20 2011 study I found at MIT that uh, uh, examined this. They looked at computer prediction systems, human predictions, and the combinations. They found that the humans, com human predictions comp composed with the human, uh, the machine predictions would outperform either acting alone. So the idea here is that even though the machines do a very good job in this particular problem, when you coupled their decision making with the humans, you had higher performance. The quote from Michael Dell, that makes this point. Now, another example is something called Centaur Chess. Computer systems, the chess playing programs today can beat any human, right? Any human. 
But what has evolved? This thing called Centaur Chess. Teams of uh, chess players, often amateurs, not even expert players, but often amateurs, will work with the chess playing program against other teams. And it turns out that these teams can outperform, also outperform, not only any human player, but any machine player acting alone. Okay? Quantitative investing is another example where the tendency has been for humans to work in conjunction with the quantitative analysis systems to do investing. Again, better results are obtained when you have the humans in the mix. And a project that was done by Dan Katz and Mike Bomarito, who are the founders of LexPredict, uh, they called the Fantasy SCOTUS Project. It deals with predicting outcomes in Supreme Court cases. And uh, they built systems that could predict the outcomes of Supreme Court cases. It would outperform most human predictions. Uh, it did not outperform consensus, uh, consensus predictions by human experts. In other words, if you took a bunch of people who were experts in Supreme Court outcomes and had them work together, they would outperform the computer. And the uh, they call it the super crowd. Uh, but also they predict that if you take that super crowd of, of real experts and you combine it with the prediction systems of the computers, that will do better still. So that's the prevailing thought on, on, on what you get from these systems. And we see it today with the computer systems that are in use. Most of them, very few of them are designed to actually replace humans. They're designed to work with the human attorney and uh, Make the allow the human attorney to do things faster and more efficiently, and in many cases to do it more effectively, to make less mistakes, to find the relevant information faster, to be more thorough. Uh, and what's likely to happen is we're not going to see as a result a lot of systems that are designed to completely replace the human lawyers. We'll see systems that are designed to enhance the human lawyers, and most likely what will happen is that the the law firms, law departments who adopt these systems will be able to outperform the lawyers who work alone, and you'll find these systems starting to integrate throughout the law firms uh, in order to simply maintain performance levels and efficiency levels uh, as against your competition. So I've got five slides of predictions, and they range from sort of the easy and immediate what's going, almost what's going on now, to the long range future, which is going to be a little bit more in the form of questions than actual predictions. Okay. So first, uh, prediction, and this is not so much prediction because it's actually happening, is that change is coming quickly. Examples of this are just the, uh, the acquisitions we're seeing of these companies like Lexus buying Lex Machina, which does uh, litiga federal litigation analytics. The money that systems like uh, Ross Intelligence, which does research, and Care Systems, which does contract sorting, uh, have been able to attract in funding. Uh, money invested in Do Not Pay, which is this interesting little sort of online application that lets you automate letters. Uh, they just launched a product where, with the click of a button and answering a couple of questions, it will literally automate the filing of a small claims lawsuit for you anywhere in the United States. So these sort of little app, and but, but Greylock Ventures, which is one of the sort of white shoe, key big investment firms in Silicon Valley, have put a million dollars into this venture already to see where it's going to go. So investment in machine learning applications for legal is being accelerated by funding. There's money there for these companies. Uh, so we're seeing hundreds of new companies getting started. Most of them are in very narrow verticals, very narrow horizontals. But we do know that Westlaw, which is Thomson, Reuters, right, uh, is spending a big investment in these kinds of products. And they have deep pockets. We know Lexus has been buying companies. And we know Bloomberg uh, has also been spending some real efforts in this. Uh, as well as a company called Epic, which is uh, computer systems for legal, but they are very, very large in scale. So we have companies that have deep pockets and the ability to invest tens of millions of dollars in artificial intelligence systems. 
and we know they're actually doing it. So this trend's going to accelerate until we get a market crash. We get a market crash, of course, people stop investing in things, and that's going to change it a little bit. But until we get there, I think this trend's going to accelerate. So we're going to end up with large numbers of entrepreneurs trying to solve, I put that in quotes, discrete pro problems in law. Okay? And we're seeing that now. I mean, we're seeing just this last year hundreds of these new companies getting started up all over the world. Most of them are going to fail commercially. I, it's just the law of the land. Most of them are going to fail. But the effort is going to generate new sets of machine learning based tools. In other words, every time you put a couple of million dollars into a company and they build something new or try to build something new, you end up with some new techniques, you end up with new tools, and you also end up with new people who are trained to build these systems and to do something interesting. So we're going to see a lot of acceleration in know-how and knowledge from the effort, even with the companies that commercially fail. Uh, and a lot of those are going to find their particular product. If they build something useful, even if they fail commercially, that, that useful thing may end up, say, with a Westlaw or a Lexus or uh, a Kara or some other company. Uh, there's going to be competitive pressures driving change, uh, both between the firms and between industries. Okay? Accounting, the big four accounting firms are getting heavily into legal. And I can I guarantee you all four of them are working on applying machine learning and other systems like that to solving legal problems. Uh, and they're putting a lot of effort and money into it. And we're going to have other alternative service providers putting pressure on the legal profession. So there's going to be a lot of prof uh, pressure on the law firms and legal departments to sort of adapt and change. And that's going to drive innovation. And we're really seeing that, uh, especially with a lot of the largest law firms, places like Baker McKenzie and Denson's and so forth. Um, so some tasks are going to become completely automated. Okay? A lot of things that lawyers actually do now, when you go off from, out of law school and you go into a firm, there's a lot of things that you do or paralegals do that can be done by machines. They're not the interesting things, and frankly, they're not the things that you're really getting the training for in law school. But you, you spend a lot of time doing them. Those things uh, can be replaced by machine learning systems, and a lot of those are going to be completely automated. Uh, but automating a task, as I pointed out, requires development and training. Every time you have a task, you have to build a tool. And that takes money, it takes time. So the question is, which task will automate first? And here's some thumbs, rules of thumb, right? Simple things are going to automate before complex tasks. Simple. The easy ones, the things that, tasks that require only one or two steps, uh, those will automate before things that are highly complex. Uh, highly repetitive tasks will automate before infrequent tasks. Again, machine learning works best and is most cost effective when you have a lot of things to do. Okay? If you're only doing something once or twice, it doesn't make sense. If you're doing it hundreds, thousands, millions of times than it does. Data-rich tasks will automate before tasks that don't have data capture. In other words, you need information. Information is needed for building out machine learning systems and running them. So uh, tasks where you're already doing those data captures and the information is there somewhere, uh, maybe as a result of a computer system, those are going to automate before the ones where it's all sort of in paper, or in file folders, and you just don't have the data. High value, low risk tasks will automate first, right? You want a, a high value because the cost benefit analysis will be there, right? Things you make a lot of money off of. But also, nobody's going to take new technologies and use it on something where if you get it wrong, your client loses their company, or it costs them, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. So those, those high risk tasks. You know, it's going to be a strong tendency to want to do those the old way, even where there might be better ways using automation. And finally, tasks that other non-legal entities can do will automate first, right? If the accounting firms can automate it and do it, if some third-party company can build a system to automate it and do it, there's going to be a lot of pressure, obviously, on the legal industry to uh, automate that as well. Uh, otherwise, they'll just lose the business. Now, nothing's going to change in the next year or two, maybe not the next three or four years. But out there, it's after that's any, any, anybody's game. So the question to think about is lawyers, how lawyers' jobs will change. 
No, he said, I, I don't think we're going to see the end of lawyers. So certainly not. That's not going to happen. But what lawyers do is likely to change. Right, right now, lawyers do everything. All right, we define the work, we manage the work, and we, all, and we do all the work. Uh, and I think that's going to change. I think for a lot of things, the lawyers are not going to be doing the work as much. Instead, we're going to be defining the work. What does it look like? How do we, how do we have to build a system so it complies with current law? Uh, how does it comply with business practices? Is law changing? How do we change the systems? We're going to build and manage the systems that do that work. Okay, we're going to play a role in that. You may not be technologists, you might not be doing the extra coding, but these systems are going to require the handiwork and the involvement of lawyers to make them really work well. And we're going to have to address the edge cases, those areas where building machine learning systems is just simply not cost effective. Okay, and that's usually things that are low value or highly unusual. And I, I would say there's a tendency on, on most lawyers to think that that's their area. They have the special snowflake. And most of them are wrong, but not all of them, okay? There are some that are doing some really things that are just, just too rare and complex to make it cost-effective to automate it. Uh, and there's still going to be and will continue to be a lot of work for lawyers to do. Some things, longer term, are really going to change in a big way. And maybe not in the next 10 years, but you start to go 20 or 30 years out. And certainly during the careers of those in the room who are going to law school right now, we're going to see some real changes in, in the legal field. And, uh, and these are more like questions, right? So we're going to see more services going to outside legal providers and outsourcing agencies. Think about TurboTax, right? And how it's sort of replaced all these little mom and shop tax, tax shops. We might see that in divorce. We might see that in bankruptcy. We might see that in commercial lending. We may see that in a whole bunch of different areas where it just makes more sense. You're going to get sort of these sort of automatic monopolies or natural monopolies in the legal field. We haven't had that before. We really haven't. But using machine learning systems and those kinds of techniques, we may find that there are these sort of natural monopolies that, that just take the work right away from the law firms and take it to other kinds of entities. Larger clients, you know, the big companies, they may find it more effective to centralize legal processes. Why? Uh, because instead of farming something out to five or six firms all who are doing it differently, they can apply technology and keep it all in-house and get, uh, get more of a bang for the buck on their technology. So when it stops going from being a, you know, it's, not, it's no longer a choice between my in-house lawyer does it or an outside lawyer does it. Now it's our system does it or I've got 10 outside systems doing it. I think we're going to see things come to centralize into, inside the in-house law firms. Um, centralization and predictive tools are going to have a real impact on how we negotiate things and even how we solve disputes. And I think this is one of the most interesting things out there. You know, we already have systems out there that allow you, at least on the federal level, to look up how long particular judges take to rule on certain things. Uh, the results that opposing counsel gets on certain kinds of cases. That's real information. And it changes how people respond to things. And as that information becomes, as, as information becomes more transparent, as negotiation systems start to uh, become uh, online as we collect more information about dispute resolution and we share it, I think it's going to change how we resolve disputes. I think we're going to see maybe less litigation. I think we're going to see changes in how people negotiate things out. And it's really going to be interesting. But I think there's going to be a lot of changes there. Um, and finally, you know, one question is what does it mean for the legal profession itself as we start to change how we work to accommodate machine learning. And this is a real interesting issue that a lot of people are starting to play around with. I know there's an effort right now in California to take a serious look at how they manage the legal profession out there and the possibility that they may allow, uh, as the UK and I think Australia has done, allow non-lawyers into the law firms as owners. And that's going to really sort of change how the profession works. And I don't know which way it'll go. It could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing. Um, it could be that lawyers, instead of sort of acting on their own, 
become just like another cog within corporate machinery. Um, the way, well, the way almost every other profession is that, that you know, does stuff on a corporate level. Um, you think about, uh, you know, people who do uh, f financial planning or accountants, right? They don't, I mean, you have accounting firms. Maybe that's not the best example. Uh, but we may find that law firms just become, you know, something that is part of larger organizations, that legal services kind of project. Don't know how it's going to turn out. It might be a good thing. It might be a bad thing. All right. So I want to I want to leave you. I'm pretty much done. It's one. I'm willing to stay and answer questions from anybody. Okay. Um, and I don't know whether we have any skeptics yet about what these technologies are capable of. But I'm going to leave you with a quote from John von Neumann, who is sort of one of the key players in thinking about computer systems. And one thing is, in, in terms of the early computer systems, and this is true of Turing, uh, I, I'm sure everybody's heard of the Turing test, for example, right? These folks were thinking about not only about the mechanics of how you would build a computing system, but even back then they would think a lot about what the computers could do in theory, what they were capable of on a theoretical basis, and keeping in mind that they were dealing with computing machines that could barely add a couple of numbers together, right? You want to do one plus one, that was tough. That's like stretching it. But they thought a lot about this. And they would encounter a lot of people who were sort of like, well, what are these things going to be good for? They can't do anything. So I'm going to leave you with this quote from John von Neumann when he was asked that at a lecture in 1948, okay, from a heckler. He told the guy, you insist there's something a machine cannot do. If you tell me precisely what it is that a machine cannot do, then I can always make a machine which will do just that. Okay? And to sum up, this is why my history goes all the way back to the beginning. Because the idea of Turing and his brilliance when he built that first bomb was the idea that you could build a mechanical device that was in theory capable of doing any computational project. And today, we have computers that can do that. So it's really just about up to our imagination and how we build them. Thanks.